Hi everyone, this is Pierre from Invia in Cape Town. It's really awesome for me to be here with you guys again. Well, sort of. Really awesome. I love your community and it's a great honor for me to kind of stand in for Dave a little bit and I just bring you this message today. So today I want to talk about something that's pretty obvious. I want to talk about Jesus, right? And uh, it's a good thing to talk about on a Sunday. Jesus is a central figure in Western history. He is literally the most talked about, written about figure in the last two millennia. And Jesus remains that, whether you are for him or against him, or you believe in him or you don't. And uh, I want to talk to you about our picture of Jesus, the way we think about Jesus, this image that we have in our minds, which is often kind of skewed and kind of difficult. And I want to talk to you about how Jesus has this tendency to turn things upside down, that Jesus isn't always as nice as we would like him to be. So Jesus says crazy things like, who is last will be first. He says things like, turn the other cheek, walk the extra mile. He says weird things like, just leave the weeds amongst the wheat. Just leave it. He says things like, give away all your money and follow me. He does strange things like he eats with sinners and prostitutes and corrupt the government officials and he eats with those people, which is sort of a side of Jesus that we know really well. We talk about him a lot like that, that he eats with, spends time with sinners. But we have to remember that Jesus also spends time with devout religious figures. He spends time with the rich and has rich friends and eats with them. He also spends time with the people who are, we would consider, pure. He spends time with priests and even with lawyers. So Jesus doesn't just get one side of the group angry, he gets all the sides angry all the time. Jesus is the one that breaks down barriers, but not just for the one side, like for both. Jesus just makes everyone angry all the time. And often like the picture that we have of Jesus in our head is this picture that many of us get from our first Bibles, like the Bibles we were given probably from a grandma or a granddad. It gave us our first like children's Bible and we have these these images of Jesus that sort of get stuck in our head where he's really just really nice. Like he's always surrounded by kids and uh, he's always like walking on the beach and like dishing out food. You know, he's like a like a Mother Teresa, but nicer. And uh, this image of our Bible of, of Jesus in our heads, a friend of mine actually says like, he's the type of person that you'd get to babysit your kids. Then you go to, or when you go to one of those nice family restaurants that have like a play area for kids and there's like child minders there. Like Jesus would be one of those child minders, you know? It doesn't matter how many kids are there, how many kids like throw up on him, he would always be there with a smile and ready to help. And this is like the picture of Jesus that many of us have in our heads like he's really nice like just a really like nice guy but we have to remember that Jesus also does like strange things like Jesus also makes a whip out of cords and like beats people with it and chases them out of the temple right upturns tables you know throw the money changers out of there like chases the cattle out and the sheep and let the dove the doves loose and all of that like it's always funny to me when people say you know what would Jesus do meaning that you need to be nice, you need to forgive, you kind of need to be like that nice guy. And then my reply would always be like, you know, making a whip out of cords is also one of the possibilities of, of what Jesus would actually do. I mean, Jesus goes as far as to tell people to hate their parents, to say that if you don't hate your parents, if you don't leave your parents, you can't follow me. So. I don't know where that family oriented Jesus picture we have comes from. Jesus is often in the Gospels like very anti-family. He's saying like there's no need to go and bury your father or go and bury your loved ones. Just follow me. And so how does a Jesus like, like this fit into your kind of standard family church with like a really great Sunday school program and a you know really great kids ministry? How does it fit in with those good old fashioned like family values? You know, this little sweet dear Jesus in Afrikaans, we have a saying, lever, which means dear Jesus, lever Jesus, like dear Jesus. It's a way, sort of an affectionate way that we teach kids to pray. 
So this little, this dear Jesus, this, this very sweet Jesus is, is not somebody that gets crucified, right? Getting yourself crucified means you have to really tick off some people to get yourself executed. Somebody that's nice and like nice to kids and gives everybody free food doesn't get crucified. So there's something that needs to change, like in our picture of Jesus. We need to actually rethink and maybe redraw this picture of Jesus that we have in our minds. Now, the Jesus that we read about in the Gospels is radical, right? The word radical has to do with root. Actually, the root word of it means literally that, radix, root. So Jesus is radical in the way that, he, that he's not so much about doing something new, but that he's about returning to the old, the way things ought to be. And what's beautiful for me is this, this, this Hebrew word, teshuva, right? Which means to return. It means to go back to the way things were intended. It's a word that we often translate as repentance, or we actually translate it as repentance. And when we have this idea of repentance in our minds as like good church going Christians, we think about leaving behind sin, you know, stopping drinking, gambling, and you know, whatever, like the, whatever the top three sins of the day is. But repentance is a lot more than that. It's about return, returning to God, like returning to God's true intent, returning to the way God created things to be like in the first place, to return to Eden. So this idea of teshuva, this idea of return has to do with being radical, with rebooting, with getting stuff back to the way they were the back to the way things should be right and there's this there's a strange thing and i and i know that that all of you can can resonate with this that that we all have this sense like this nagging sense somewhere deep inside of our spirits deep inside of our souls that things just aren't the way they should be that something is wrong that something is wrong with the world and it always reminds me of uh, the film The Matrix, one of my favorite films, and I'm sure many of you know it as well. There's this great scene where the character Morpheus in The Matrix talks to Neo, the main character, and he says to him, he, he tries to explain to him that he, he already actually knows the truth. And he says to him these words, he says, what you know, you can't explain, but you feel it. You felt it your entire life that there's something wrong in the world. You don't know what it is, but it's there, like a splinter in your mind, driving you mad. And we all sense this. And I think that this has something to do with the brokenness of creation, that we all sense that things are not the way they should be, that this couldn't have been what God intended, that there must be something more and we strive towards it in the future, but the truth is that much of it lies in the past, lies at the root, lies in God's intent that we see in Eden, where he walks with man in the garden, with the humans in the garden, where, where humans are in perfect harmony with one another and in perfect harmony with nature. There's something about that, about us, us being image bearers of God created in his image that is broken. And we all feel it on this really, really deep level. So when we think about the whole Bible story like that, Jesus came not to do something new per se, but in a way to take us back to the beginning, back to our roots. And that's why Jesus is radical. Like he's not necessarily turning things upside down, although that it might feel to us like Jesus is turning things upside down, thing, saying things like the last is first and give away all your money and follow me, feels to us like he's turning things upside down. But actually what he's doing is he's turning them the right way up. In John 8, 23, there's this beautiful scripture and it reads, in the NIV it reads, you are from below, I am from above. You are of this world and I am not of this world. Now this, this scripture in Afrikaans, in my language, when it gets translated, it reads something like, your roots 
are d dug deep into this world. Your roots are dug deep into this world. But my roots, Jesus speaking now, he says, my roots are not dug into this world. I am from heaven. And that's why we say that we are the ones that have things upside down. It's like sort of like wearing a sweater inside out and you don't really know it until somebody tells you, hey, dude, your sweater is inside out. The label is at the back. And then you can like turn it the right way around. So Jesus, his roots are in heaven. It's our roots that are on the earth. Jesus did not come to just hand out tickets to heaven, like buy in the sky when you die. And this is something that I really, really deeply believe and something that we, we see in the Gospels all the time and in the whole of Scripture, in fact. It's not about just going to heaven when you die. When you die, it's about a real new change right now. Jesus came to show us firstly what it means to be a human being. Jesus is like the archetypal human. He even calls himself like the Son of Man. Jesus didn't just come and show us a way to heaven. He, gave, he came to show us how to be human, how to live the kingdom away here now, how to live, in fact, the right way up. And we see this, this thinking, this message from very early on in Jesus' ministry. In fact, from like his very first public appearance, his first sermon so to be so to speak jesus is turning things already upside down or the right side up depending on your point of view so i want to read for us from luke 4 from verse 16 to verse about 29 it's when jesus goes back to his hometown and he preaches in the synagogue this is like his first his first sermon now i remember my first sermon it did not go as badly as Jesus' first sermon. <laughs> so the text reads, He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went to the synagogue, as was his custom. As he stood up to read, the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor, he has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to, pro to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed. I remember this. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son? They asked. Jesus said to them, Surely you will quote this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself. Do you hear in your hometown what you have heard that what we have heard that you did in Capernaum? I tell you the truth, he continued. And here's where Jesus turns things upside down. I tell you the truth, he continued. No prophet is accepted in his hometown. They just said he was so well spoken and they were so amazed. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet, Elijah was not sent to any of them but to a widow in Seraphat in the region of Sidon. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elijah the prophet, and not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got, got up, drove him out of town, and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him down the cliff. But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. Now, I don't know about you, but my first sermon did not go as badly as that. Like Jesus, after he finished his message, the crowd or the congregation wanted to take him outside and throw him off a cliff. All right, so this call of Jesus, Luke 4, is his 
mission statement. It's what Jesus' ministry is about. So what is happening in the scene if we kind of backtrack and just look at it? Why are these people so angry? I mean, the sermon wasn't that bad. I mean, I've heard worse. Jesus, in this little piece, proclaims the year of the Lord's favor by quoting Isaiah. And this year of the Lord's Savior is a very, very important concept in Scripture. It's also referred to as the year of Jubilee. Now, the year of Jubilee was like a Sabbath year. So for every seven years, there was a Sabbath year where the land could rest and there were a couple of other things that could happen to give people sort of a break, right? But now the year of the Lord's Favor or the year of Jubilee was sort of the seventh seventh Sabbath year, like once every 50 years or the 50th year. And it was supposed to happen every 50 years, although it hardly ever did. This was actually one of the, one of the big, one of the big um, claims that the prophets had against Israel was that they never kept the Jubilee. They never did this. So in the year of the Jubilee, a couple of things happened. It was a year where the land could rest, could lay fallow. So any good farmer knows it's good for your land to rest every now and again. So the land could rest for a year, the farmlands. And the debts were forgiven, like all debts were written off. The slaves are set free. And the big thing that happened in the year of Jubilee was that the land went back to its original owners. So this is like a very, very radical root, radical thing, especially the, the last one, that the land goes back to its original owners. So for any kind of good Israelites, you are connected to your land. That's what made you a Jewish person. That's what made you an Israelite, is being connected to land, right? But what often happened is when times of famine or in times of natural disaster, people would lose their ancestral land or they would sell it in order to pay debt. Or and eventually they would sell themselves as slaves or their family, their wives and their kids as slaves to try and relieve their debt. And they would be working the land, their own ancestral land that they lost. Now, this system was designed that every 50 years, everything sort of reset and everybody got back their land, but it never really happened. Now, you have to remember that the the people that Jesus is speaking to in the synagogue, these people are poor. Like about 80 to 90 percent of people in ancient times lived below the breadline, meaning they did not have enough to eat every single day, right? So these people were poor, they were being oppressed by the Romans, they were severely, severely taxed. Some of the scholars estimate the tax could be anything from 30 to about 40% of your income. So if you catch like a lot of fish, about 40% of that fish needed to go to to the Romans, needed to go to the authorities, or 40% of your crops. Like That's a lot for people who are already poor. So this proclamation of Jesus that he says, This is the year of the Lord's favor. This is the Jubilee. This is good news. That's why people are so amazed when he, when he, when he says it, they go, we're so amazed. Is this Joseph's son? I can't believe he's saying this. This is such good news. This is so awesome. So when you read the text, you can see this. You see that the people are excited. This is good news. You know, most of them didn't have enough to eat. And, you know, maybe this Jesus, who we actually know, like he's one of ours, maybe this Jesus will save us and he will chase these Romans out and he will finally free us. You know, many people, like I've said, they've lost their land, having to sell it to pay off debt, even sell themselves as slaves to pay off debt. And we have to always remember that this was the expectation that the people had of the Messiah, that the Messiah would be this rebel leader, this revolutionary political warrior that would come and free them physically from Roman oppression and reestablish Israel as a nation, right? So, so this is good news. This is like not a bad thing at all. Freedom for the captives, recovery of sight for the blind, like all these great and awesome things. So why are these people so angry? I mean, so angry that they want to throw Jesus off of a cliff, right? So right after Jesus makes this amazing statement that announces the year of the Lord's favor, he makes this shocking statement. He says, I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time, 
when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a famine throughout the land, right? There were many widows in Israel, like good Jewish women, right? Many, many, many widows who were suffering. Yet, Elijah was not sent to any of them. But to a widow in Zarephath, <laughs> in the region of Sidon. To an outsider. To one that was not like them. And then Jesus continues, and this is really shocking. It says, there were many people in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha, the prophet. Yet none of them were cleansed, only Naaman, the Syrian, right? So Jesus, in short, is saying, yes, this is happening. It's happening. It's a jubilee. It's a thing you've been waiting for. It's happening, finally. But you're not getting it. They are getting it they will receive the year of the Lord's favor. That's why people are angry. So I cannot stand the word they when it's sort of used to generalize certain people and certain people groups. Like, so especially in South Africa, it's sort of used in this sort of polite way to be elite, like elitist and generalize. And perhaps you can resonate with that, with that when, when people say something like, you know, they always like, you know, that loud music or, you know, they always like, you know, that type of strange food or, you know, they just aren't that bright. Like they referring to a certain people group. And like that really grates me when people do that because you're separating yourself from those people, right? So, well, in this passage, this is exactly what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying they are getting the Lord's favor, the ones you don't like the ones you look down upon. Their prisoners will be released. Their blind will see. Their oppressed, not you, will taste freedom. Like no wonder these people are angry. Like Jesus, Jesus even dares to use a Syrian as a recipient of God's grace. Now I'm on the Syrian. Now Syrian was part of the Assyrian, Ray, uh, Assyrian Empire, sorry. The Assyrian Empire, and the Assyrian Empire was one of the most violent and cruel empires ever to be on the face of the earth. They were like the arch enemies of the Jewish people. They were the people that took the northern kingdoms, ten tribes of Israel, into exile. These people were not nice people. These are the people that Jonah refused to go to, that he said, I'm not going to these people. These people are cruel. The, the Assyrians used to skin people alive and then nail their skins to the gates of their cities as a warning to anybody that dares to challenge them, right? The Assyrians used to create the same sort of destruction that an atomic bomb would do today, but they did it by freaking hand, right? So they would literally not leave one stone on top of another. They would work salt into the field so they can't so you can't plant there again. They would literally go and plant weeds in the city so the cities can over, can be overgrown. These were not great people in the in the eyes of Israel, in the eyes of your kind of everyday good Jewish person. But yet Jesus says that God's grace and God's favor is for them. And that's why these people are so angry. So imagine for a second, who, like, who are the people, just, gen, just generally, the people that we as a, as a nation or you, know, you as a nation or us as a nation collectively sort of dislike, right? I'm sure it won't be hard for you to imagine that. I'm sure it's not you. I'm sure you like everyone, right? N nobody in this building, when you, those people outside. Who are those people that, that nobody likes, right? So I'm not naming names, but you know. Now imagine Jesus saying to everybody, you know what? They are getting everything. They're getting God's favor. They are going to reap the benefits of the year of Jubilee. So, and that's like sort of the thought and the gist that I want to leave with you on this Sunday. God's kingdom works differently than we would like it to. God, his plans are still the same. It has always been. He wants humanity to return, to shuva, to repent, to come back to him, to love one another, to love him, to walk with him in the garden again, to be in harmony with all people, 
to be in harmony with nature, to walk with them in the garden again. But, and here's like the kicker, and this is what is often like upside down for us, it's for everyone. Everyone. And this is this radical idea that the Bible still teaches even today, that there's one God, right? One God, but that God is for everyone. There was once an argument between a person and a rabbi, and the rabbi talked about my God, my God, my God. And then the person answered and said, how can you say this God is for everyone when you keep on saying my God? Then that God is for everyone. So I love um, C.S. Lewis when he writes, he writes this amazing little piece on, on getting to heaven. And he says, um, when he gets to heaven, or if he gets to heaven someday, he, firstly, he'll be amazed and surprised if he is there. And secondly, he'll be amazed and surprised at who is there. And then lastly, he'll be amazed and surprised at who isn't there. God's kingdom and God's values are different than ours so different that they appear upside down and that's our invitation that's my invitation and your invitation is to align our values the way we think about God's grace with his we cannot be like Jonah that says I refuse to allow your grace to go to people that's the story of Jonah I don't want God's grace to be on the Assyrians and that's why the people are so angry in the same story in Luke 4. We don't want God's grace to be on the outsiders. Right? But God's kingdom is different. It's upside down. The roots are in heaven. So in Africa, we have what we call a baobab tree. You might have seen it. It's a big, humongous tree and its branches, it looks like roots. There's some old legendary tales that said the gods were angry at the tree and planted it upside down and there's like different versions of the story. But it looks like its roots are reaching out towards heaven. And that's sort of become a symbol of God's kingdom for me. That the roots are actually in heaven. That, it's, that we are the ones that are upside down and that we need to pull our roots from the earth and dig our roots back into heaven. God is the one who includes the ones that we exclude. Jesus announces a jubilee, a year of freedom, of return, of debts being forgiven, of slaves being freed, of land returning, of rest. But not for the insiders, for the outsiders. He announces it for those that include. He doesn't announce it for those that exclude. And that's the question. That's the question we all have to ask ourselves. What would a Jubilee life look like in our nations across the globe? What would it look like in our communities, in our schools? What would it look like to let the earth rest? What would it look like to let the slaves, whatever that means, go free? What would it look like to cancel debt? What would it look like to return the land to its original owners? And this is all scary stuff when you start taking these things, not even literally, literally is way more scary, it just metaphorically is already very scary. It's crazy stuff, it's radical stuff. And that's what Jesus is about. Jesus is not just the meek and mild and very nice, child-minded Jesus. Jesus is radical. Jesus turn, he turns things upside down. And this is hard for us because we are so used, we are so used to this upside down world that we think it's the right way up. And perhaps it's time to allow Jesus to turn us about, to turn us like the right side up. That's what I want to invite you towards today. I want to invite you to be turned around to be returned to God's original intent, intent, to what he wanted for this creation, for this world, for our humanity to be together, to no longer draw boundaries and draw lines in the sand, but to like join hands and be together and include and not exclude. 
and to work for freedom and for peace. That's what God is inviting us to. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you have come or came to turn the world the right side up. Forgive us when we keep on turning it over again. Help us to see it your way. Help us to see it the right way. Help us to see it the kingdom way. Help us to live out your kingdom, your way of peace, your way of generosity, your way of forgiveness. Thank you that you guide us and that you love us through your Holy Spirit. We pray this in your name. Amen.